Grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus, and welcome. We're in the midst of March, in the midst of Lent, and in the midst of our study of various spiritual practices. This week we've invited you to take time to set aside for worship, to incorporate worship in everyday life. So I thought it might be a good moment to return to the letters of Paul, ask what Paul had to say about this practice of worship, and then explore a little bit of what it is we do here in a traditional Lutheran worship service. So we're going to start with Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 14. We're starting at verse 26. What should be done then, my friend? When you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. If anyone speaks in a tongue, let there be only two or three at most, and each in turn, and let one interpret. But if there is no one to interpret, let them be silent in church, and speak to themselves and to God. Let two or three prophets speak and let the others weigh what is said. If a revelation is made to someone sitting nearby, let the first person be silent. For you can all prophesy one by one, so that all may learn and be encouraged. And the spirits of prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is a God not of disorder, but of peace. I'm skipping ahead a little. Anyone who claims to be a prophet or to have spiritual powers must acknowledge that what I am writing to you is a command of the Lord. Anyone who does not recognize this is not to be recognized. So, my friends, be easy, eager to prophesy. Do not forbid speaking in tongues, but all things should be done decently and in order. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Many liturgical churches, like the Lutheran Church, look back to Paul's writings as a definition of what the liturgy should be. Not that it has to be the same each time, not that we have to meet in a formal space like this, but that there should be order, that people should be able to hear what is being spoken and, perhaps most importantly, to understand. And that is one of the reasons we're going to do what we're doing today exploring what it is we're doing in church. So I'll start with you down here at the font. This is a baptismal font. You might have noticed that it moved in the past couple of years back to the center of the church. That's because it is the center of our identity together. We enter the church through baptism, primarily, through the proclamation that we are God's beloved children, through the waters that say, even though we are sinners, we are also redeemed by Christ and made whole and holy. If you come up for communion and you pass by this font, or you're passing by as you leave, you're invited to dip your hand in. There's always a little water. It's not because you need this water to be holy. Your baptism accomplished that once and for all. But it is a reminder, an invitation to dip our fingers in and remember we are God's beloved children. That no matter what else has happened in the world or in our lives, since our baptism, God's promises stand firm. And ours too, our commitment to repent of our sins and return to the Lord, to love God and love our neighbor. All of this starts here at the font, and we keep it here as a reminder, open and accessible to the whole community, knowing that no one, no one, fails to be loved by God. This is then where we gather for a worship service. You'll see me step down or other pastors step down to the font to begin the service. We all start here at the font, and so does our worship service. So we gather in place here. We then turn to hear the word of God. 
The word of God is proclaimed, we hope, in truth and in full explanation of what it is we're doing here. It's one of the reasons these are lifted up in our churches, not to elevate the pastor themselves or the lector, but to remind us that we return to the word of God when we want to hear what it is God is calling us to do. We return to the Lord of God for challenge in our lives, for hope, for redemption. We hear these in the word of God. And then we respond in song, in prayer, in sermon, in any other way we can. So if we start at the font, we then proceed to the word of God. And then at what seems like the height of the service, we turn to the table. The table is front and center. Christ's invitation to you that you are invited to take a seat with him and his disciples at that last supper. And again and again through the practice of communion. We pray at this table, we share the bread and the wine in the belief that Christ is truly present at this very table, speaking to us as close to us as the food in our mouths or the breath in our lungs. We hold on to Christ in the physical sacraments of bread and wine or grape juice, whatever you need. So we go to the table next knowing that Christ receives us as we are. And finally, finally, we are sent out into the world because worship is at its essence an opportunity for us to grow closer to God and to one another, to build one another up, as Paul kept saying, but for a purpose. We are being built up to go forth into the world and proclaim the word of God in word and deed. To live out the gospel. If we love God, we must also love our neighbor. And so an integral piece of the worship service is the sending out. You'll hear the assistant worship leader say something to the effect of go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Or go in peace to share your bread this season. This is our invitation The work is just beginning as we leave the doors of the church. This is a place for us to build one another up, to care for one another, to walk with one another in faith, to learn and grow, to confess, and come to the waters of baptism over and over again. But then we respond in joy for these gifts, in joy for the gift of redemption and salvation, We go out into the world to share that joy with the rest of the world, to share the unconditional love of God that we hear about, that we receive, that we even eat in our worship service. We go out into the world. We do that in song, in word, and of course, in physical movement out into the world. So, I thought we could end today on a hymn. This is one that I really like. It's pretty short. It was originally written to be sung in Spanish and was translated into English. And it's called The Lord Now Sends Us Forth. Number 538 in our red hymnal. The Lord now sends us forth with hands to serve and give to make of all the earth a better place to live. The Lord now sends us forth with hands to serve and give to make of all the earth a better place to live. The angels are not sent into our world of pain to do what we were meant to do in Jesus' name that falls to you and me and all who are made free. Help us, O Lord, we pray, to do your will today. The angels are not sent into our world of peace. 
global peace, that peace of God that surpasses all human understanding. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. And amen.